Good afternoon, Anthem Church. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the house. Um, my name is Alex, and my wife's name is Arena. We have four kids, and uh, uh, we are blessed uh, to be part of Anthem Church, and uh, we have the honor of serving here. Um, I serve in the Board of Trustees, and our family has the honor of serving uh, or uh, leading a life group with the Silchuk family. And uh, it's a blessing for us. And if you're not part of uh, a life group, please join one. Uh, you won't regret it. It's, it's been a blessing to our family, and you'll be blessed. Um, so we'll be reading today from Galatians 4, uh, 8 through 20, in honor of God's word. If you're able, please stand. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did, you did me no wrong. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my conditions were a trial to you, you did, you did not scorn or despise me, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that, if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become an enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shout you out that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose. And not only when I'm present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. This is the word of the Lord. Please remain standing for prayer. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for these moments. We can gather as a local body, uh, both redeemed and those that are seeking to be redeemed. Uh, we believe that your word is powerful and effective, and it could truly, truly illuminate the mind for us to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Father, we pray that it would, it would happen so today in this service. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Happy Father's Day for all the gentlemen out there that father sons and daughters. Um, we have the greatest example of a father, and that is uh, God our Father. Amen? Just like it was mentioned by Pastor Alex Koval. Uh, my name is Alex. I serve as one of the pastors here uh, at, at Anthem Church. The last three weeks, uh, we had um, some of our other elders and pastors preaching, Pastor Eugene and uh, Pastor Sergi, and I, I think Pastor Vic as well preached, and they did a phenomenal job. We were all blessed by it. I got to sit, sit and just rest and be uh, rebuked and convicted and inspired all at once, and so I just want to say thank you, gentlemen, for doing that. Um, the funny part was that was part of my, like, paternity leave. And uh, it did not happen so. <laughs> right after the last sermon uh, that Sergi preached last week, on Monday, my wife delivered a, a, a baby girl for us, Eleonora. And, uh, and so today I'm up. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm excited because this text was, I'm like, thank you, Jesus, that I got to preach this text. It's a really, really good passage. Um, if you are new or just visiting us, we've been going through the epistle of Galatians. Um, this is Apostle Paul's uh, beloved church or churches. Specifically, there's this region called Galatia. And he's writing to these churches. And really, his heart, the thrust of this book is to, uh, it's to uh, call out this sinful tendency to apostasy. The sinful, uh, sinful uh, tendency of apostasy, which means to uh, forsake God for some kind of 
uh, something lesser than God. We see this originally happened in the, in the garden uh, in Genesis where Adam and Eve, they, they backslid from God to the forbidden fruit. Then we see it in the story of, of, of Israel in, in the Exodus account where they have seen God. They've seen the cloud. Moses goes up for 40 days and 40 nights and they backslide to a golden calf. Right? And so we have this tendency to backslide, not only them, but also us. The Galatians, their, their backsliding, their apostasy was led to the law. They were backsliding to the law, right? Um, and, and so Apostle Paul, he is livid. He is frustrated. He is so anxious and so uh, uh, upset and he's so zealous uh, because he doesn't understand. He, the language that he uses is he is, he is, he's, He's, uh, uh, he's bewildered. He's, I'm bewildered. I'm astonished that you are so cl- quickly forsaking him. And then in chapter 3, he says, who has bewitched you? Who has cast a spell on you? Who has brainwashed you? Who has, who has come into your home at night, tied you up, put you on their shoulders, and carried you away from God, the one true God? Who did it? I mean, he's just baffled. He cannot believe that the Galatian Christians are so quickly deserting the Father, a personal relationship with the Father for something that is uh, uh, weak and worthless. And so why is he... Why is he so uptight? Like, Paul, take it easy. Why don't you just focus on your own salvation, right? Like, why why are you so upset and frustrated? And we'll get to that in a moment, really, why. But um, I'm actually going to close the sermon with that point. But here's what what he's he's trying to relay to the people. He says, look, formerly when you did not know God, right, when you were oblivious, you were naive, you had no idea about God, these these pagan uh, people, these Gentiles, uh, you were uh, slaves to those who by nature are no gods, right? You were enslaved. You, your allegiance, uh, your worship was, was, was towards uh, uh, gods such as Zeus, Poseidon, Hermes. Ladies, you're all familiar with that god, right? Hermes, right? I mean, that one's going to hit differently. <laughs> Uh, and, 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 and they were enslaved. Their devotion were to, were to these golden calves. And he says, look, they, they were worthless. They were weak. They added nothing to your life, no worth to your, to your life, to your existence. They did not justify your life. They didn't. They fell short. Every time they fell short, just like this prodigal, uh, the story of the prodigal son, right? He thought the, this lavish uh, lifestyle, immoral lifestyle of just YOLO, you only live once, just go and uh, spend your money on whatever you want, hit, 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 the, hit the clubs and, and, and hit the uh, shopping malls and, 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 and go rent the, the, the fanciest cars. Uh, that failed him. It failed him. He was worse off. At the end, then when he started, it failed him. Those idols, that 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 lure of that allure of this life, it did not deliver. It did not deliver the wealth, the autonomy that he desperately wanted. It ultimately failed him. It ultimately failed him. And the analogy that Timothy Keller uses for this state that they are going back into, that which they were already living in. It's this, it's this reality or the state of, uh, of, of being on trial, being in a courtroom. When you're on trial, you're being prosecuted, right? And there's all these witnesses and all these different lawyers that are accusing you. And here's what they're accusing you of. They're saying, look, your life does not matter. You, don't, you do not matter unless, unless you do this, unless you give yourself to this, unless you put all your eggs into this basket, only then will your life matter. And so what happens is you're, you're, you're scrapping for witnesses and you're scrapping for defenders, you're scrapping for different things that will justify your existence, that will justify your life, that will fulfill you, that will satisfy you, that will give you a sense of, of security and a sense of salvation. And what happens is they all fall short, they fail. They fail, and so uh, you, you're standing condemned, and there's no one that is able to justify you. There's no one that's able to redeem you. You're standing condemned in this court. There is this suspense. There is this anxiety. God, when will I be justified? 
When will I finally arrive? When will I stop hitting those dead ends? God, when? And so he says, that was your formal state, but, but you found out about God. Now you, you remembered about the Father's home, and you went back to the Father, right? You went back to the Father, and, 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 and you knew that the Father could actually give you a position in your home, and so you came to the Father, and you approached the Father with this posture of, God, make me one of your slaves, one of your servants, Right? How, uh, look, look, God, Jesus, what, what must I do to prove my worth? Tell me what to do. I'll do it all. I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to do to pre- prove my worth and my existence. I'll do it. I'll justify myself. Right? You knew God. You, knew, you, you, went, you went straight to the source of life. And what's beautiful is God did not just leave you there where you know about God. Why? Because if you just know about God and God does not know you, you are becoming just like the older son, a slave. A slave. Slaves, they don't have a personal relationship with the owner. They're only there for a certain specific purposes. And God did not leave you there. That's why he corrects himself, the Apostle Paul. He says, better yet, God knew you. Better yet, when you came pleading to, uh, from, from irreligion to religion, God says, no, no, I will not allow you to be just like my older dead son that's, that's, that's a slave to religion. No, no, you are my son. I know you. I want a personal relationship. I want you to have a seat at my table. Actually, listen, let's throw a feast for you. Let's put a cloak on your shoulders. Let's put a ring. Let's get you, get, get you the best kicks in the house. Come on. You were lost and now you're found. You don't need to justify yourself. You don't need to work. You don't need to prove anything to me. Listen, case dismissed. You are innocent. And that verdict, that verdict of, of innocence that verdict of it is finished, that verdict is the proof, the proof is, is, is enough. You are my son. I don't need anyone to prove it. I don't need any other person to come and, and try to plead your case. No, no, it's done. Do you remember that? Do you remember that feeling when, when, when you left that courtroom, man, and you came home and you don't have to worry about the next trial. You don't have to worry about the next hearing. You don't have to worry about more proof coming up from the past. You don't have to worry about none of that. It's done forgotten that easy yoke the light burden do you remember that shalom in your soul do you remember when when you could just rest rest enjoy life enjoy the simplicity of life enjoy the ordinary people that make up your ordinary life remember that when you didn't have to hustle and didn't have to prove anything do you remember that didn't that feel good Right? Kind of that feeling that we got from Top Gun when we watched that movie, man. You walk out, man, that, that just feels so good. Mission accomplished. Come on, guys. Mission accomplished. Go Tom Cruise. Man, that's my guy, right? And that's the movie, and it, 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 it does something. It probes certain feelings. But, man, that feeling of being redeemed and justified, there's, no, there's nothing. It, it's second to none. And God says, look, you are there. You are, there's people in this room that you were there. And so he is, he's so frustrated because we were there. We've tasted the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We were there. And then he goes on to say, he says, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? I can't believe you're going back into the courtroom. I can't believe you're calling up those lawyers that that literally failed you. They were not capable of fighting for you and and pleading your case. They failed you miserably. How in the world are you giving them a second chance when the case is dismissed? Doesn't that sound ludicrous? That sounds crazy, but it's happening right now with many of us in this room. And here's how it happens. Timothy Keller, or not Timothy Keller, N.T. Wright, he's a a British scholar. This is how he puts it, talking about the, the, the prodigal son. He says, it's one thing to say, I don't deserve to be your son. It is quite another to say, I don't, I do not desire it. I prefer slavery to sonship. 
Yet, that was the folly of the Galatians under the influence of their false teachers. Yet, that is the folly of many people in this room today. No, we don't deserve to be his sons. That's one thing. But not to, to desire to be a son? And what does that even mean, to desire to be a son? To have a personal relationship with God. To know God deeper. To, to, to long to be with him. To just enjoy every moment with God. And so, we actually prefer to plead our own case. We prefer to, to earn our own standing in the Father's home. We prefer the position of a slave, a servant. No, no, God, I messed up. No, I squandered everything. I get it. You gave me all that inheritance. No, no, it wouldn't be fair to the older brother. No, no, Father, I'll work for it. I'll work for it. No, no, I'll hustle. I'll grind. No, no, we'll, we'll get it done. Don't worry about it, Father. It says that's foolish. You, you don't understand. You don't have what it takes to pay your debt off. And the only reason I'm, I'm, I'm dismissing what you owe is because I desperately love you. I just want my son back. I don't care about the wealth that you squandered. I just want you back. Friends, look at me. God wants you back. He wants you back. The creator of the universe that sustains the solar system. He wants you back as a son, not as a servant. He loves you. And so what, what draws us back into slavery? What is it? James chapter 1 verse 13 says, when tempted, no one should say God is, when, when tempted to go back into the courtroom, no one should say uh, the judge is calling me back into the courtroom. No, no, God does, no, once the case is closed, God's not calling you back. What's, what's actually causing you to go knock on the courthouse is the evil desires that are dragging you there. And what are those evil, evil desires? It's these longings that we have. It's these longings for approval, these longings for meaning outside of Christ. Outside of Christ, they are dragging us. There's, some, there, there's this ache. There's this ache that we have. And it's dragging us. We're not victims. No, no. We are making this decision ourselves to go back to the courtroom and knock on the door. And you know what's happening in the same time? You have the demons, the, uh, Paul says, these evil forces, these demons, and uh, the way Peter talks about it, he says, be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around look, uh, like a, li a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's looking for someone that has this evil desire. And he's like, hey, I, I, I know what that itch is. I know what it is. Right? And he's offering these different options for us. And he says, listen, this can redeem you. This can justify you. This can fulfill you. This could be your sense of identity. This could be your sense of security. And so we're, we're back into the courtroom. We're back into spiritual slavery. And so what does spiritual slavery look like anyways? Right? We're talking in these abstract uh, 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 terms here, but what does it look like practically? If you look through the scriptures, you will see that idolatry is more than temple worship and image worship, right? Idolatry is more than a golden calf. Who worships a golden calf these days, right? Do we? No, for us it's different. Our, our, our idols, they are disguised. They have a different form, a different image, and idols, idol worship, it's anything or anyone that steals your allegiance and worship away from God. Anything or anyone that steals your allegiance, your energy, energy, your devotion, and your worship from God. Right? It's anything that makes you praise them more than to praise God. Could be... And I'll get to those in a moment because I don't want to repeat myself. There's a lot. I've got a list of like 13 things, and that's just starting. They present themselves as legitimate, legitimate uh, options. But friends, they're weak. 
They will fail you. They are worthless. They will not add any worth to your life. These gods, these idols are enslaving. They are enslaving. The moment you choose them as an option, listen, you are not getting off the hook that easy. They're enslaving. Right? They're ens- but you're like, no, no, they're not enslaving. I choose to give my devotion to these things. I choose to binge watch Netflix shows. It is by choice. No, it's not. Originally, it was by choice, but then you got sucked in. And the reason why it's so hard to break loose, and we have a lot of things that it's so hard to break loose from, is because we have been enslaved by evil forces. We've been enslaved. And so what is, what is this seek, what is this seek, how, how to, how, what does this enslavement look like? What's that hook that keeps us? That keeps us hooked, that keeps us in bondage. What is it? What does this chain look like? And it's simply this. This is what the evil forces will tell you. This is what, these are the thoughts that will come running through your mind. I cannot imagine my life apart from this thing, this status, or this person. I cannot imagine my life without this. I can't imagine the evening without this. I can't imagine my morning without this. I can't imagine my day without this. I can't imagine my summer without this. I cannot imagine my 20s without this. I can't imagine my 30s and 40s and 50s and finally 60s without retirement, without this thing. And that's the, that's the allure. That's the hook. That's what keeps us going. I cannot imagine my life without this thing. And so what are these things? Paul, he starts off and he gives us just an idea. He says, you are observing special days, months, and seasons. For the Galatians, what it is, is they are, since they are being attempted by the Judaizers, perhaps it is Sabbath, perhaps it's the Day of Atonement, perhaps it's the festival, uh, 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 festival uh, uh, feast festivals, right? All the different Judaic feasts that they were doing circumcision, right? There's all these different, different uh, 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 traditions that they have. And so they are enslaved. If I don't do this, if I don't, if I don't practice the Sabbath, if I don't, no, no, the Sabbath is my salvation. No, the feasts are my salvation. No, no, this is my salvation. For us, it could be summer. And if we don't have, if we don't have good weather this summer, I just can't imagine this year. I mean, this year, you might as well just scratch it, Right? And if I don't go on spring break, if I don't, if I don't do this, no, oh, what's, what's the point of living, right? If, if we don't celebrate my 30th birthday, do I even matter to anyone, right? If I can't put on the best birthday for my one-year-old with the arch, if we don't get the arch, right? Why are we even doing this whole mother thing for? Right, guys, guys, listen. I know I'm kind of being, I'm exaggerating, but is it not true that we have this desire that says, look, if I don't do this, if I don't give my child the best birthday, if I don't have the best birthday for myself, if I don't have the best summer, like if the weather's not going to be on point, like, like what's the point? We have power. Right? Life only has meaning and I only have worth if I have power and influence over others. If I don't, then I don't see myself meaningful. As a pastor, as leaders in the church, this could be perhaps our tendency. This could be perhaps our, our, our idol that we are lured into, right? If people don't respect me, then what's the point of pastoring? Right? Do I even matter to you guys? If you don't honor me, perhaps it's comfort. Right? Life only has meaning if I have this kind of pleasure, experience, certain quality of life, money in the the account. Life only matters if I have this kind of lifestyle. Right? I mean something. 
I'm worth something if I have this kind of lifestyle. Perhaps it's approval. Life only has meaning. I only matter if these people approve of me. And if I don't have that, I can't imagine my life with, without it. Maybe it's work, right? My life only matters. I only have meaning if I hustle and grind. If, I have, if I'm running three, four businesses at a time. Man, if I'm only running one business, like what's the point? Right? Don't tell me to shut the computer. Don't tell me to wrap up the cords. Don't tell me to put the, uh, I don't know what else you guys do, right? <laughs> what are the nursing stuff. Don't tell me I need to clock out. Maybe it's achievements. Life only matters if I accomplish something in life. If I have certain certificates on my walls and people walk in and they're like, Mr. Man, by the age of 30, unbelievable. Man, they don't make them like they used to. Right? Don't we like that? They don't, oh, no, they don't. They don't make them like they used to because I'm a grinder. I'm a hustler. Right? Friends, idols. Idol worship. Back into the courtroom. Back into, and then, man, sometimes it gets really messy in the courtroom. It gets really messy. Then you start hitting the deadly duos, right? Then you got, look, if I don't have, if I don't have the uh, mochi mochi donuts in the morning, does the morning even matter? Coupled with if I don't have the beach bod, right? Now you got, you, you got food that you are, your allegiance is to, and now you have the beach bod that your allegiance is to. And those are opposing each other. Hustling. And being a present father, those are oppo opposing each other. Dave Ramsey and keeping up with the Jones is opposing each other. If you don't know what Dave Ramsey, that's just being debt free, right? And, and, and living your, your, your best life now, they are opposing each other. They're opposing each other. You got these two lawyers that are trying to justify you, but they are contradicting each other. And so you're just, you're caught up in it, convicted. Looking like a fool. And so some of us are sitting here today, and I hope all of us are sitting here today, thinking, is that me? Can I resonate with some of these idols? Man, am I, am, have I given my allegiance and my worship to those weak and worthless idols that by nature are not gods? They cannot justify me. They cannot redeem me. They cannot fulfill me. Have I bought the lie? Have I not been on guard and sober-minded? And so how do we know? How do we self-diagnose? Number one, if you cannot imagine your life without these things, they're idols to you. Maybe it's fishing, going on hunting trips, right? Whatever hobby you have. Friends, if you cannot imagine your life without it, run from it. Run. It's not wrong to have things. It's wrong when things have you. Number two, if you distance yourself from other people or even lash out at them when they threaten these things, you got a problem. If you begin to distance yourself from people that don't respect your authority and they don't respect your, your position, and you're like, you know what, I'm gonna, uh, you're a waste of time. I'm not going to spend time with you. Right? That's a problem. If you're distancing yourself from people that are not grinding like you and hustling like you and don't have the same aspirations for a certain lifestyle as you, uh, 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 that's a problem. That's, if you're only hanging out with people in the same class, that's a problem. It's a problem. And then lastly, if you are distancing from God, you're distancing from His Word, that's like reading your Bible every morning or, or, or praying, seeking God. If you, if, you, if you start to see you don't have time for that because you're so busy chasing all the other gods, you got idols. 
if you don't, if you, if you've distanced yourself from obey, obeying God's word because it will uh, uh, be a threat to that lifestyle that you want, it might compromise, it might get in the way. So you would rather distance yourself. You would rather go work in the fields. You have idols. How are we? How are we doing? Right, we just we've got. How are we doing? Do we have idols? Four of us? Let's kill them. Let's slay them today. Come on, the rest of you guys, good luck. <laughs> Court is not dismissed. Two types of, of, of spiritual uh, bondages. Irreligious, that's, those are the ones that are in direct uh, opposition to God. Uh, and I mentioned them, idol, uh, work, power, sex, materialism. They offer freedom and fulfillment, but rather they are weak and enslaving. And then the other ones, religious uh, idols. And those are uh, morality, right? That's the older son. No, no, I, I'm going to hustle. I'm going to follow all these rules. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be abstinent from all these different things. I'm going to live about, above reproach, right? I'm gonna, and God, I actually don't have time with you because I got to knock all these out. I got a lot to work on, God. A lot to work on, right? And, and, and it's those things that give you a sense of salvation and give you a sense of fulfillment and give, look, as long as I read my Bible, I just got to read my Bible, I got to get through my annual Bible reading plan, and man, if I don't read it, then I don't feel saved and I don't feel, really, does my life even matter if I don't read today? Friends, those could be religious idols. You have to be careful that you don't swing from the younger son to the older son. They're both in bondage. And so how do we escape from these idols? How do we escape from this slavery? Well, number one, you have to admit that you have these idols. We have to acknowledge them. Confessing our sins. The Bible says if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will have fellowship. We will have fellowship. We will have that union that we desperately long for, that we've been redeemed for. And so how do we, how do we uh, expose these idols? Psalm 139 says, verse 24, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Right? Every morning, Lord, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. God, would you show me these false gods in my life? God, would you expose it as we read scripture? Let's not think about other people's idols. Let's, let's be hypercritical hyper of our, ourselves. Let's analyze ourselves. God, is this me? Is it I, Lord? Is it I? Is it me, God? Are these my idols? Listen, and, and, and don't just stop there. Call up people in your life. Ask your spouse, honey, is this my idol? Friends, are these my idols? Mom, dad, are these my idols? Can you please speak into my life? I'm worried that there's something stealing my allegiance from the Father. I feel heaviness. I feel anxiety. I feel, I, I, I just feel cloudy, God. I don't feel, I don't feel content. I'm, re I'm restless. I, I can't point my finger on it. What is it? Please, somebody help me expose my idol that is weak and worthless. Please. That's a stumbling block for me, please. And so we do that in our life groups. We do that in our freedom groups with our men. We even do it here. We do it whenever we get together. Man, we do it all the time. We do it all the time. Because Satan never takes a break. Satan never takes a break. We remember God, number two. Thank, we remember that God knows us. Right? It's, it's not the fact that you know God that keeps you going. It's the fact that God knows us. God says, what shall separate you, uh, what shall separate me from the love of God? There's nothing. Once God gets a hold of you, listen, nothing will set. I had somebody come here uh, today in the morning uh, after service and they said, listen, uh, there's these false accusations that are going against me uh, throughout the whole week. I just sense it. Uh, these thoughts are coming towards me. Like, how do I fight it? And I said, look, God says, I don't, I, a daughter, uh, 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 I don't condemn you. I don't condemn you. And I said, look, that's all you need to remember is the Father does not condemn you. Sin no more. Go and sin no more. 
remember that God does not condemn us. And then number three, worship the Father. Worship the God. If you want to expel the dumb idols out of your life, we have to learn to ponder on the majesty of God. We have to uh, learn how to sing about His majesty. Well, that's why we dedicate three songs at the front end of our service to sing about the majesty of God. We are doing our best and we, we're, we're, we're doing whatever we can to make sure the songs that we pick are all about Him, not about us. Not a, about God, His majesty, His, his supremacy, uh, His goodness, His grace. Because it is those things that lead us back to the Father. We need to read the Psalms until our hearts begin to burn. Until the glory of God outshines the glitter of these idols in our lives. Until the glory, the majesty of God, man, you, you ponder, you, you use your logic, you use your mind. Until the glory of God outshines the glitter of these worthless, weak idols in your life. And this is a practice that I do for myself. Before I purchase any car, before I purchase any, any toy, man, I go and I worship God. I go and I think about God. I go and spend time with God. And I just want to see, Lord, will you flush this out of my system, please? Would you? Because a lot of the uh, uh, spending that we make is because these, these idols, they have these glitters. Oh, this will make you happy. Oh, this will fulfill you. And man, we would save so much money if we would just begin to spend time in His Word, spend time in His presence, and flush all that junk out of our hearts. Amen? Thank you, brother. St. Augustine, he had this famous quote, and it's a two, I'm going to share it in two parts, so just give me a moment. The first part feels wrong, feels controversial. You might get, get the wrong reflex, and here's how it goes. He says, love God and do whatever you please. And, and the parents respond is, don't say that. My teens are here. Do not say that. My spouse is sitting in the sermon. The last thing they need is for you to say, love God and do whatever you please. Right? A couple weeks ago when I was preaching on Galatians chapter 2, I was talking about the Christian freedom and tribalism. And, and I talked about that every Christian is going to have a different kind of freedom. And listen, it got out of control. I got people emailing me, what are you doing, pastor? Why are you giving green lights for our church to start doing all these different things? Why? Why are you doing this to them? Right? Why are you torturing my spouse like that? It's, now we're all worried because who knows what they're going to start doing. And friends, listen. If we begin to build walls and barriers, we're, we're swinging to the older brother syndrome. Idols of rules and regulations. And so what we desperately need is we need the well. The well that will satisfy us, and here's the other part of this quote, for the soul trained in love to God will do nothing to offend the one who is beloved. Did you guys hear me? The soul that is trained, disciplined in love to God will do nothing to offend the one who is beloved. If you love God, you don't have to worry about your spouse going gambling or getting drunk or going sleeping around. You don't have to worry about doing who knows what, God knows what. No, no, you don't have to. Listen, if they've tasted and seen the goodness of the Lord, they will start forfeiting their freedoms in Christ for the sake of the weaker vessels. And this is why Paul, he closes this passage with uh, verse 19. He says, my dear children, for whom I am again, poor Paul, again, again, in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. The only suffering that Paul is concerned about is this burden that he has for people that keep going back to these worthless idols. 
the only thing that keeps Paul up at night is not the threat against his life. It's not the fact that maybe he doesn't have food tomorrow. It's not the fact that he might, like, his, his ship might uh, 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 flip over. That's not what he's worried about. He's worried that the moment he leaves church on Sunday, everybody's back worshiping their idols. That's what he's worried about. That's what keeps him up at night. That's what keeps us up at night. God, why have they only shown up once a month to a Sunday gathering? God, perhaps they have idols in their life that have sucked them back in that are weak and worthless. And Paul is up and he's, the, the language that he's using, it's like childbirth. My wife just had a child on Monday and I'm telling you, it's, 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 it's crazy. It's in, in, it's painful. I don't want to go into details, right? But it's crazy. It's crazy painful. And Paul is experiencing this pain. And he says, listen, I will, I will be in this pain until, until cr- the heart of Christ is born in you. Until God is formed in you. The very heart of the, the good son, it becomes your heart. Until you begin to desire the will of the Father over your own will. Until you begin to look at people, not as objects, but as children of God. He says, only then will I be able to rest until I have delivered. So Paul, the the way Paul views success is not packed out sanctuaries, but people that have Christ formed in them. That's why our vision is to be with God, become like Jesus, and then do what Jesus did. And Paul says it, I want all of you guys to become like me. I want all of you guys to become like me. And it's like, Paul, what do you have in mind? What what does it look like to be like Paul? To be in childbirth pains for people that are worshiping false idols. How do you know that you are finally a son? You're no longer a slave. How do you know that you're finally free? You're finally, you have the heart of the Father. You spent time with the Father. You're influenced. But how do you know? It's when, when you, you lose your sleep over your lost neighbors. You lose sleep over your friends and your family and your spouse and your kids because they have walked away from the Lord. You're losing sleep because, because people around you, they are being sucked in by these worthless idols. You are in pain for these people. And so my question for me My question for all of us, are we experiencing this anguish of childbirth, of birthing as Paul is for broken people? Is that us today? When was the last time we walked around our street and actually thought about the broken people that desperately need God, that are still stuck in this courtroom being accused? When was the last time we were broken for these people? Friends, if we are like Paul, if we are like sons, no longer slaves, no longer slaves to religion, no longer slaves to irreligion, listen, we will burn for these people. We will stay up at night, man. We will be consumed, not about us, but about these broken people. We will spend all of our life for these people. Sunday service is, friends, this is not like childbirth pains here. I know for some of us it feels like that. Jeez, an hour and 15 minutes, brother, goes over sometimes, right? Why would you do that to us, pastor? Friends, no, no, this is just a huddle. Man, we're just here, we're just talking. What would it look like for us to have these pains for broken people? What would it look like for us to be part of new life and new birth and liberation? What would it look like for us to be these abolitionists? I don't know if you guys have watched the movie... uh, Harriet, right? This uh, it's uh, African American gal, and what's it's such a good movie. I it's I recommend it. All of you guys go home and watch it, and go to one hour and thirty three minutes, specifically that spot. And what's interesting is when she runs away from slavery and she runs to this organization called the Under Underground Railroad, right? She uh, she gives her life to going back into slavery, not not. Her, but she disguises herself as a free woman and she goes and she begins to slave, uh, save, save slaves from their uh, slave masters. And she comes to a point where now it's more than 100 miles of travel. 
it's now 600 miles of travel. And in this scene, in this movie, this, the, the, the organization, everyone's like, man, this is getting risky. Maybe, we, maybe it's time to uh, sh- sh- close down shop. Maybe we can't do this, right? And she says, seriously, just because it's getting hard does not mean we need to give up on freeing these people. And you know what she says? She says, you must have forgot what it means to be a slave. You must have forgot. She says, we got comfortable. She says, when was the last time you heard the groaning of a little boy that is, be, be, uh, is beat because he's not working before he even knows what work is? When was the last time you heard the screams of a young girl that's being raped before her, before her first blood? When was the last time you heard the groanings, the weepings, the, the sighs of enslaved people? And friends, that's what kept Paul at night. He could hear it. It would, it would haunt him. The cries of people that are enslaved to these worthless, weak idols such as fame, people approval, uh, comfort, power, uh, materialism, binge watching, food. And he would just, he, he gave his life. And she's, this is what she says. She says, I will give every last bit of my blood in my veins to free as much people as she she freed 70 slaves friends how many people have we freed how many people have we led to Christ and so there's two things that need to happen today number one you need to be set free you need to be set free and number two And it's time for us to step up and begin to give ourselves all all of our life, not just Sundays, all of our life to the will of the Father. To the will of the Father. I did not come for the healthy, I came for the sick. I came to seek and save that which is lost. That is our mission. We live on mission. Amen? So two things that you have to do today. If you guys want to stand on your feet, we're going to pray. Father, Holy Spirit, would you reveal to us our idols? Would you reveal to us, Lord, what enslaves us, what entices us, what lures us into bondage? Father, have mercy on us. Have mercy on me, God. Lord, have mercy on me, God. Show me, God, what is What's fooling me? What's distracting me? Show us, God, and give us the grace to repent. Give us the grace to turn around and come back to you, not as servants, but as sons. Back to a personal relationship with you. Father, I pray, would you once again give us a burden for broken people? May this be the mark of sonship, God, that we now are broken for the prodigal son that has left the father. Lord, and we will not sit around, God. We will go and seek and search out just like Jesus did. We will will break bread with sinners. We will we will celebrate holidays and we will spend summers, God. We will get creative. Whether it's eat, drink, sleep, whatever it is, God, we will do it all on mission for you, Father. Help us, Lord. Enable the Spirit of God to do that. I pray in Jesus' name. Friends, this is a time for reflection. God bless you.
Friends, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, this Saturday, 4 p.m., we're doing a father-son uh, day. It's going to be fun. We're doing like a cowboy theme. It's going to be amazing. What needs to happen, ladies, I'm just going to talk to you right now. Uh, register your husband and your kid uh, today on the app. That way they can be enrolled for the raffle. For their, There's going to be a, a giveaway for the fathers. And then if you have, a, uh, you have a students that are in high school or middle school, register them for the camp. Uh, with inflation, we got charged a lot more for the campsite. Our church is not making any money. We're actually investing around $7,000 on top of what the camp's charging us to make this happen for our uh, our teenagers and our, our students. So this is going to be the best investment this summer for your kids. It's going to be better than Hawaii, better than Florida. Listen, uh, this is three days of just investing into their soul, renewing the mind, giving them moments and opportunities for the Spirit to, to come and, 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 and form Christ in them. Uh, uh, five days? Jeez, people. <laughs> Uh, it's $315 for, for a student, $315. And uh, yeah, and then lastly, uh, a major announcement is we finally hit a million dollars in our savings account, people. Come on. That's huge. God is good. God is good. And so uh, Pastor Cole will say, not if we have to pay the $7,000. <laughs> Friends, uh, we got root beer floats outside. Go spend some time. Be intentional to meet somebody new. Uh, remember, show hospitality. That's what we do best. God bless you guys.